Give it over to Max. Thank you very much. Okay, let's get started. Um, just a brief uh, intro about me. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Yes. All good. All good. Okay. Um, my name is Max. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So prior to joining Digital Asset, I was working as a software engineer at a crypto sports betting company. Um, so yes, have been in, I would say, this space for a little bit, um, has had first firsthand experience seeing people using crypto, would I say in a useful way? Maybe in an entertaining way. But I do think blockchain is here to stay, um, whether or not if it's going to be an individual use case or an enterprise use case, um, it's going to be here to stay. So today we have a mix of developers. We have a mix of, you know, I would say business corporate people. So I'm going to start at a higher level as to, you know, what block, what smart contracts are um, and go down and paint a couple scenarios for you guys as to why uh, smart contracts exist or why they should exist. Um, so just three bullet points, very simple, this presentation. Um, what are smart contracts? Why do we need smart contracts? demo and chain code which is hyperledger's version of the smart contract um, and we're going to go line by line on some of the smart contract uh, templates so smart contracts right i can tell you in plain language they're programs stored on a blockchain and they run when predetermined conditions are met so a little code example here is um, if received payment transfer ownership from seller to buyer Right, it automated, automates the execution of the agreement. Um, everyone knows that there's a certain outcome and you can read about it, you can see it in the code and it just depends. So for example, some code might be more complicated to read so only developers can understand the smart contract. Um, so it is very important that if you're writing a smart contract, you want it to be uh, legible to people who aren't developers, say the least. Um, so here's a scenario, um, let's say Sally. Sally, the seller, wants to sell her PlayStation 5, okay? Then we got Bob. Bob, the buyer, has money, and he wants a PlayStation 5. Sally might just say, pay me first, then I'll send you the PlayStation 5. On the other hand, Bob is going to say, no, send me the PS5 first, and then I'll pay you. So this transaction is not going to occur without any sort of trust, right? Um, there's the first option, which is a physical meetup. Um, like we are doing now. Um, and that is, you know, they meet, they exchange, everyone is happy, Bob gets the PlayStation, Sally gets the money, done deal, right? And people are always concerned about safety, but meeting some stranger in public is also a safety concern that people seem to forget about, right? So we have option two, trust a third party. Um, <laughs> boo, yeah, no. So, right, there's Amazon, there's eBay, um, these are third parties that we have been conditioned to trust already, right? They deal with the shipping with UPS, FedEx. Um, Sally gives the PS5s to Amazon. Bob pays Amazon the $100 because we trust Amazon with our money. It takes two days, but in the US it's instant, almost like a couple hours, then you're there. <laughs> but so it's, it's really quite actually straightforward. Now, the thing is though, if you're trusting a third party, the usual complaint is, we don't trust them with our data. They take a fee, they take a revenue cut from Sally, they increase the price for Bob. Um, why do we need a third party? I'll tell you why we need a third party. Um, it gives each participant incentive to act fairly, right? Um, without the third party, someone can just take off with the product without paying. So Sally's reputation is at stake. She has a five-star rating, great. Bob has two stars, we don't trust Bob. There's reputation at stake. There's Amazon's brand image at stake. Within this enclosed system, people have the incentive to act fairly. But so to say they don't want the third party. No trust, we are back to square one. What do we do? Okay, let's, let's go through the scenario again, but this time with a smart contract, right? And we're gonna narrate the scenario in parallel to what could be a public space. So what we're gonna use is Ethereum, permissionless network. That means anybody can participate in this network. There's no KYC procedure, there's no ID. As long as you can get an address for the wallet, <clears throat> you're set. 
Now, the question that I want everyone to think about is how do we incentivize each person in this case to act fairly? If there's no third party, you know, judging what you're doing, how do we get everyone to act fairly? So in this Ethereum network, let's say Sally creates a smart contract and it says PS5 for $100. She deposits $100. And why, why do you think Sally should deposit $100 even though she's going to be selling her PlayStation 5 already? Anybody have an idea? Staking, yeah. I'll give, I'll give a prize. I have like these travel adapters. So if anyone answers, I'll give you a travel adapter. Um, but yeah, staking. So in order for people to act fairly, they need some skin in the game. They need, some, they need to lose something, right? So Sally's $100 is locked up in the smart contract. Next, we have Bob the buyer. She sees that Sally is, he sees that Sally is committed to sell this PlayStation. She's not going to sell a PS4. She's not going to sell a broken PS5. Otherwise, she loses her money. So Bob says, okay, I will put in $200. $100 is the price of the PlayStation. The other $100 is his deposit so that he doesn't lie and say, oh, you know what? I didn't get the PlayStation, but he actually got the PlayStation. And if he did lie, then he loses his stake. Last but not least, we have Dave, the delivery man. So Dave sees that there's two parties involved and he says, okay, I want to participate now and I can help you too. I can deliver Sally's PlayStation to Bob and I'll deposit $100 here as well. And this is to make sure that Dave doesn't just take the PlayStation and run off as well. Otherwise he loses his deposit. So now that everyone has stake in the smart contract, this is when the transactions can occur. Sally is gonna give Dave the PlayStation. And Sally is also going to give Bob's key to the deposit. So in this case, Dave actually controls Bob's deposit. Now, in order for Bob to get his money back, he has to meet Dave. Bob has Dave's deposit key. So in order for Dave, the delivery guy, to get his deposit back, he needs to meet Bob, right? And if they don't meet each other, they don't get their deposits back and everyone is unhappy. Um, once everybody has their keys for their deposit, I take the key. I go to the smart contract and I can unlock my hundred dollars. I get my deposit back and usually you get a fee. So the delivery guy would have an extra fee in there, which is his service, right? Bob also unlocks his deposit and he gets his PS5 and his deposit back. And Sally gets her deposit as, as well as the hundred dollar fee that she wanted to sell her PlayStation for. So you can see in this world, everyone is happy. They've gotten everything they needed. They got their deposit back. Um, everything is working perfectly. Now, this is what you would model a, a physical asset delivery, right? It would be much easier if it was a digital asset like an NFT where you could transfer the ownership. But in this, you can see there's a lot of flows. It's because we're concerned with a physical asset in this, in this uh, scenario. Um, but like I said, a permissionless network, actually anyone can see the transactions going on here. Um, there's no protection of privacy. So if I redo this entire scenario again, and at step four, Sally gives this PlayStation to Dave, right? But Dave can actually see how much this PlayStation is worth. If it wasn't a PlayStation, if it was some life-changing value asset, right? Dave saw this, how much that he was transporting. He could technically run off. He runs off with this physical asset. He doesn't even need his deposit. Bob's deposit is locked in there. Sally's deposit is also locked in there. Um, that is not a good design. So this design is, would be more naive. It's just to showcase you a potential flaw in the system. Um, so these are people, right, that are transacting with each other. They're not enterprises. Now, when you think of enterprises, you would think lots of transactions, lots of people going right through, they're, they're trading goods all the time. Um, so in this case, enterprises have to have privacy. In this case, right, Bob saw the value. We don't need every party to see every line of information in the network that they're in. Permissions, right? In this case, Dave was a bad actor and he's gone and we can't track him down because he's anonymous in this, session, in this uh, network. And finally, scalability. Um, in enterprise scenarios, there's a lot of transactions going on Actually, each time you transact on the Ethereum network, you incur a fee and they call it gas. So 
this deposit system is not very scalable. It's not very efficient. Everything is going to cost a fee. This whole thing is going to be more expensive than just having a regular, I guess, centralized third party like Amazon. So comes the <clears throat> permissioned network. This is a blockchain infrastructure that actually doesn't allow everyone to participate. You have to go through a KYC procedure. Well, you don't have to. We, the participants decide what they want to do with this whole permission. Um, it depends on what they want. In this case, Sally the seller, Dave the delivery guy, and Bob the buyer, they have been permission to enter. This bad actor can't go in. He's not allowed to see what's going on. So if we were to do this whole scenario again, from Sally's perspective, she can see the PS5 is for $100. But from Dave's perspective, he might just see an item ID. Um, he won't see anyone's deposit. And that is the value of being able to hide the crucial information from people who don't need to see the transaction of everything. And then we have a bad actor who's trying to get into the network. Um, we realized that he didn't pass the KYC procedures or anything related to that. Um, so that's the benefit of the permission network. You can control the privacy. You have much more security. Um, you're able to do the permissions in a lot more, I guess, in a much more intricate detail. Um, and enterprise blockchain solutions are currently adopted widely today. And maybe not many people understand, but for example, we have Hyperledger Fabric, Bezos, Sawtooth, Corda, Daml. There are huge companies that are currently relying on enterprise blockchain infrastructure precisely because of these three things that I had mentioned up here. Right there, privacy, permissions, and scalability. Without these three things, it would be difficult to say whether or not enterprises would adopt the blockchain technology and whether or not blockchain technology would be widely adopted um, for mass adoption and for everyone to use. Um, <clears throat> so examples of what these people are or are um, big enterprises that are using it. Now, on the left-hand side for Daml, Hong Kong Exchange, Australia Stock Exchange, and Singapore Exchange. They are using Daml to, I would say, decrease their settlement time for trades. Um, for Australia Stock Exchange, they're replacing their entire post-trade um, settlement system with them. Uh, Singapore Stock Exchange, they've just issued a $400 million public bond with them. On the right-hand side for Hyperledger Fabric, you have Walmart, huge supply chain company in the US. They rely on their blockchain infrastructure. And in fact, they're using it to track the providence of their goods, which just means they have the ability to know at any time, at any place, where the goods are in the supply chain and where they came from. And it's an interesting story, actually. I think the lead for this project put a pack of mangoes and said, okay, where does it, do these mangoes come from? And it took the staff seven days. And after the whole project um, went into production, it only took like minutes, May maybe even less than minutes. But that's the power of, um, I would say, relying on blockchain infrastructure. And for Honeywell Aerospace, I don't think many people know, but Actually, there's a lot of small shops that will rebuy or buy secondhand aerospace equipment, you know, jet engines and whatnot. And it's super expensive. Um, there's a lot of procedure that goes in. You have to verify whether or not it's airworthy, they say, whether or not it's safe. And currently it is a man, or before this, it was a very manual process, um, you know, paper documents and everything. But with Honeywell, they created a marketplace where they can track every step, every past verification of this product. And as a buyer, I don't have to go through this manual process anymore. Um, so this whole time I've been talking about smart contracts. What do they actually look like, right? It's just diagrams and fluff words. So I would like to show you what they actually look like from a developer's point of view. Now, on the left-hand side, we have the DAML code, right? DAML code is template based. This is the code that Hong Kong Stock Exchange, Singapore Stock Exchange uses. Um, and it models specifically the rights and obligations. And it's designed specifically for, you know, interacting on a distributed ledger scenario. Uh, clearly, you know, actually concisely shows who the controllers are of a certain contract, what can they do? On the right-hand side, we have the Hyperledger Fabric chain code. And chain code, you can actually write this in JavaScript, you can write it in Go, you can write it in Python soon. Um, so it offers you know, great flexibility for developers to use this. Um, there are different characteristics which I'll go into, but you can see that Fabric 
it caters to a wide variety of developers. If you're a Go developer already, you can already write smart contracts on Fabric. If you're JavaScript, you can do that already. Now, there is a twist because with great, what would we say, great flexibility comes great responsibility. And you'll see that later. Now, smart contracts are used, they're different on every platform, right? If you chose Fabric, if you chose Bezos, Socket, Corda, you have to learn a different language and use their infrastructure and you're stuck to it. If you decided to use DAML, that actually works with the underlying blockchain infrastructure. So the idea here is that you would learn it once and you can deploy it on any other sub infrastructure that you need. In fact, you can even just code it locally on your computer. And then if you like for a prototype, and if you decide you want to move to Postgres, you can use DAML on Postgres. Then you want to widen the net and use blockchain infrastructure. Then you can decide to do that. You're not actually tied in from the beginning. So it offers you know, a lot of flexibility. Um, but I'm, um, what did I say before? Oh, so that's a database. Sorry. Yes, that's a centralized database. Um, oh, I said blockchain. Sorry. Um, so I want to give an example of what we can use, uh, do with DAML. And I like to use just real examples and less uh, theoretical. Um, so on the right hand side, we have British pound note. Um, and on number one, on the right hand side, you can see this is the obligation for the central bank. I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds. Okay, so anyone who holds this, this is a contract in real life. You take it to the bank, we'll give you money. Everyone recognizes the ability of what this uh, note does, to, does for you. We have the signature at number two. Um, this is the signature of the counterparty. The value, right, is, no, oh, one second. The value of it, um, actually, there would be no value if no one would recognize that the central banks um, is obligated to pay them, right? If no one believed that the central bank would do that, if the central bank didn't take their obligation seriously, this note would be worthless. So in exchange, they sign it. This is their, their proof of obligation, their, their worth. Now, in DAML, you can just model this using a template. So as I said, it's a template-based uh, code. It's not like JavaScript where you can write anything you want. This is domain specific, built specifically to be able to work on distributed ledgers and model contracts. Um, with the template, we have the properties. And actually you can think of this piece of code right here as a table in the database. And the properties here are columns, right? So you have the issuer, the owner, the currency, and the observer. And what observer just means is anyone who's in this list can see this contract. This is a very important concept. It's mainly due with authorization. Um, it's one of the main concepts and these permissions permeate every aspect of DAML code. So the signatory is the one who is allowed to create and archive the contract. If I'm a signatory, I can create it. But if you're not a signatory, you cannot remove the signature. But And so I can see every contract. And if I decide to add you as an observer, then you would be able to see this contract in the database. And I'll, there, there'll be diagrams so you can actually visualize it later. And then we have the controller here. In DAML code, we have choices. And you can see here clearly, it's who can control, it's the owner that can do the IOU transfer, okay? We specifically stated it. So if I was holding this, doll, this bill, I'm the owner of the bill, I can give it to my friend Toby here. Um, the bank can't do that, because I'm the owner. The bank is the issuer, but he's not the owner of the bill. Now, every template, oh, that's falling apart every template, the new template is a contract and it, each contract is unique. So an instance of the template IOU would be considered a contract. Now, just to step up and give you a little bit of a bird's eye view here. Um, actually, one sec, I'm gonna fix that. Yeah. Sorry, people online, um, the projector fell. So um, a high level view is the, um, just the recommended architecture. So on the left-hand side, I don't think you can see very clearly, but in, is it out of focus right now? No, we are fixing the uh, projector right now. Okay. I'm going to go with this. I can't zoom in at the moment, but I will just narrate it to you. So there's a red box on the left. 
That is the demo code, independent of all the other code that you write. Okay, so you can write your demo code independent of your front end, independent of your back end. As long as you get the flow of your smart contracts, whoever transacts with the parties, you can write that. And then what happens is it'll compile into a DAR file. And this DAR file actually will generate a library that you can use in React. So then you can actually just directly interact with the ledger through the React code in the front end. You can say, you know, add a contract, archive in a contract, a specific person, if you log in, you can do certain things with this contract. So it's extremely easy to just deploy onto any front end and to use it immediately. The learning curve is, well, not exactly flat, but not exactly 100% steep either. Um, but very easy, and I and I recommend everyone to just go to the Bitly try demo. You can see the SDK. You can download it later and play around with it. Um, but just to recap, so mainly what Daml does is that it just provides the smart contracting language independent of any other infrastructure. Um, it works on, say, VMware, Fabric, Sawtooth, Bezu. Um, and that is just the benefit of being able to use Daml and then decide later on what type of infrastructure you want to use. Now we have chain code, Hyperledger chain code. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for chain code, you can write smart contracts with several, uh, um, through several different languages. You can, if you're a JavaScript developer today, you don't actually have to go learn Daml. You can actually just write the chain code in JavaScript. You write in Go, you can type the, the contract in Go. And the difference between chain code and Daml is that chain code is, you know, you write with functions and methods. It's just like a JavaScript class right here. Sorry, what? Next. Oh, next three pages. Yes. Oh, oh, it makes three pages. Yes. Yeah. So I've actually commented out the code here because it does get very long, very long. Um, and it's precisely because the language, you, it's a regular programming language. It gets into so much detail that as the programmer, you need to be, you have to be very careful. You have to know, you know, what you're trying to write. Um, with Daml, it, it, I would say it abstracts away the need to focus on privacy and you can focus on the business logic. Um, in chain code, you're going to have to have the business logic and um, be, you know, take into consideration the privacy and you'll see very soon here. So these are the functions. In Daml, we have uh, choices. Now you can see it transfer IOUs. Um, this piece of code actually doesn't know who the owner or the issuer is, right? As, as written, it, it doesn't know. Um, and in order for me, and also for the query IOU, in order for me to make sure that I can't transfer away someone else's IOU into, and put me as the owner, I have to actually write that out. So if the user who's requesting this transfer is the owner of the IOU, then I can do it. Then I can just transfer it to, to whoever I want to transfer, but I can't transfer someone else's. Um, same with the querying, right? I shouldn't be able to look at someone else's bank account and see how much money they have. Um, that needs to be explicitly coded in the chain code. Um, so this is what I mean by when Daml helps you with the privacy, it, it abstracts that away. You don't have to worry about that. With chain code, this is stuff that you have to think about. Um, and these are just a few lines, but when multiple parties are involved, um, it can get quite long. So you, as, as a chain code developer, you need to be careful of actually just coding two complicated things. Um, it might just be that um, the, I would say, it, more lines of code just mean more potential for bucks, right? So you have to be very careful. Um, and back to Daml, just for a visual explanation, right? If, if I'm using Daml and I was the bank, because I'm the issuer, I'm the signatory, I can actually see everyone's data. I can see all the rows here. Now, Sally, as the owner of her own contract, can't see Bob's, right? Because she, Bob isn't the signatory or Sally isn't the signatory of any of Bob's contracts. And similarly for Bob, he can only see his own. So if I am logged in, say from a front end as Sally, you get you generate like a unique username or a token and I access, I hit the database. And this is actually what I'll see, okay? The, the privacy is taken care of. You didn't actually have to code anything else except for what you see on the screen right here. Um, and same with Bob. And if we go to the bank again, if the bank tried to transfer your IOU, they wouldn't be able to do that because the bank is not 
the, the owner, right? The code says controller is the owner, not controller is issuer. So if the bank tried to do that, there would just be an error that explicitly says that. Now, if we want to do it with um, chain code at the moment as coded, there's no privacy in there. I can see everything. Now, in order to do what we did with Daml, I would have to add a few extra lines saying, okay, the user can't, the user has to be the owner of the IOU in order to be able to see. If I'm not, if I'm requesting someone else's IOU, I can't see it. It's not allowed. And if Sally tries to transfer someone's IOU at the moment without any authority or permissions coded in, they can do that. They can just change the name from Bob to Sally. They just called the transfer IOU and put their own name as the new owner. And then I would have to code out another step to stop people from doing that. Um, so that's just, I would say, a, a more detailed overview in terms of the code. Um, DAML is a template, right, based uh, coding language and Fabric, you can see, is regular programming language that any of the flexibility is in there. Now, there are, you know, some trade-offs. DAML, straightforward to read, write. Is it more flexible than writing chain code? Probably not. Um, chain code, you can actually, with JavaScript, you can write anything you need to, but that's the trade-off. If you have anything that you can write, there's just a lot more things to think about when you're coding and developing and you're prototyping. Um, so I would say just to recap, uh, actually we can skip this slide. I mentioned it earlier already, but with DAML, it works on multiple infrastructures. Um, and with chain code, if you chose this, you would be on fabric. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still a business decision, right? And it influences whether the programmers will influence the CTO probably or the other way around. And at the end of the day, it'll be a decision for the company to make. And if you need to make a decision which doesn't lock you in, um, perhaps DAML would be a safer choice. If you die hard know that what you need is Hyperledger Fabric, then by all means, you can use uh, Hyperledger Fabric. Um, and just to go over um, some of the learning resources here, uh, try DAML, we have, it's, it brings you to the forum but you can install the SDK, you can go on the learning and look at all the tutorials. And we also have a demo discuss forum um, to make it a little bit easier for you guys. We also have a WeChat community where there's several demo developers in there already. So if you guys want to join um, those sitting at home, you can scan this and uh, join our WeChat group. And on the right hand side, it would just be our demo community. Um, you can, and actually we've just reached our thousand questions uh, benchmark on the forum. So there's a lot of people talking there. Um, and that concludes um, the presentation. I'll, I'll send this out later. There's just a couple more links in there that you can use for your own uh, resources here. Um, but yeah, um, I think we can go with some Q&A. We don't, oh, thank you. We'll, we'll get the platform.